From the depths of late 2000, when Pokemon was past its red-hot super craze, its familiarity was already very widespread. And of course it wasn't a surprise that a sequel game would appear in the future to get the ball rolling and expand the canvas of the Pokemon universe. Catching glimpses ever since 1999 of the new monsters you couldn't possibly capture or know a lot of in movies and the TV show, things were ready to get underway. Of course, Professor Oak says in every game, and Dexter in the first episode of Pokemon, There is no statement, there are still Pokemon yet to be identified. Continuing from where red, blue, and yellow left off, Game Freak, under direction of Satoshi Tajiri, developed two new Pokemon versions for the Game Boy Color. Bringing in a new wave of pocket monsters and expanding onto the gameplay that the first three games introduced. The first three games were named after colors, soon to be collectively known as the Color Generations. These new ones took a step beyond. And these sequels were called, come on, everybody together now, Pokemon Gold and Silver! Gold and Silver were both released in Japan, way before North America, of course, in November 1999. That's right. When we were just getting ready to watch the first movie in cinemas and the first generation of Pokemon climb to its peak, that's when they had it. I've got a Pokemon and you don't. And when the now called second generation was released to the world, Pokemon would have grown and changed and established itself as a permanent player in Nintendo's family. The story was bigger, the Pokemon were new, and the gameplay was way more intricate. And the box start and package of the cartridges had a familiar sight on them. Lugia! Hey, wait, I remember Lugia from the movie 2000! Awesome! And Ho-Oh for gold! Wait, Ho-Oh? What kind of a stupid name is that? And wait, I think I remember this from... Wait, from here! Not only that, but it was so shiny, so shiny and pretty and wonderful. You couldn't resist just to get the box! Also, this cartridge, to me, had this really nice nostalgic plastic goldish color on it, with little sparkles in it, which kind of reminded me of some kind of toothpaste. Darn it, it's pretty! I wish it had a flavor. Much like the old games, this one made us all excited to mercilessly rip open the case and shove the cartridge into the Game Boy Color, and start the most epic Pokemon journey to date. The story setting takes place in the west of our old familiar land of Kanto. The stomping grounds of the original Color Generation games, which we didn't know was called Kanto until now. This new region was called... Johto! Despite being a new region in the games, it's full of history and legends. And is meant to feel more old than Kanto, which is sort of the modern part of the Pokemon world. But in my heart, I will always love good old Kanto. Anyway, with that in place, the game begins. Oh man! Where are the new Pokemon? Who cares about the new Pokemon? These are awesome. Yay, Jigglypuff! Bonka Pikachu! And then what happens? Oh, there's a new one! There's a new one too! There's a new one! There's, new one. there's Charizard! Oh, there's The very minute you put gold and silver in the Game Boy Color, you could tell this was already totally worth it. I mean, for all the innovation created for the color generations, simply having a graphical advancement would be worth playing through. The game made total use of its 8-bit color palette like red, blue, or yellow could only dream of. At the time it was released, many more people owned a Game Boy Color. 
However, Gold and Silver were courteous enough to still keep the cartridge normal Game Boy compatible, so none of the older guys would miss out. Each Pokemon had two colors used to it, as opposed to the first generation where it was just two shades of the same basic color. And yeah, they took some shortcuts where some of the Pokemon sprites are the exact same as the one they were from Yellow. And the graphical interface was far more clean, and the Pokemon designs were solid and finalized. Remember coughing in Red and Blue? <laughs> One of the coolest differences in Gold and Silver were the different poses for each monster that were exclusive to each version. That did not happen in Red and Blue, and made the games much more unique instead of just a super carbon copy of each other. The back sprites were also revised and refurbished. Talk about a facelift there. Each person, item, Pokemon, and place had unique colors that made this game feel much more solid and appealing than its predecessors. However, I do miss the different color hues for each town in red, blue, and yellow. It's just so clean and nostalgic. Ah. Anyway, back to gold and silver. Hey, what's this? What happens at the beginning of the game? Gold Silver incorporated a real-time clock that you could set in the beginning of the game, and it kept track of the time much more effectively, giving the game a much more realistic and alive personality. The events inside the game would change depending on the time of day in real life. Playing it at 9pm? It's dark in the game as it is in reality. Playing it at 7 in the morning? It's dawn there too. The differences in the day also had different Pokémon appearing in the wild. For example, at daytime, Pidgey would occupy the tall grass, whereas under the cover of night, the nocturnal owl Pokémon, Hoot Hoot, would be prominent. The innovative use of this idea made this new escapade into the Pokémon world far more alive and realistic. It even had day-specific wild Pokémon. For example, at Union Cave, a Lapras would appear on Fridays, ready for capture. However, the tragic downside of this was, of course, the internal battery that kept the clock going within the innards of the cartridge would eventually run dry. The result of this? Game save erase. No! Thankfully, this would only happen after many years. But I've just rediscovered my Pokemon Gold cartridge in a very dusty spiderwebbed attic after six years. And my game was historical to me. I caught them all. 151 Pokemon, beat the game inside and out, had my most powerful and hard-worked Pokemon in there, and they were a staple mark into the stories we created from them. I put it into Pokemon Stadium, and... it was all gone. The battery was dead, and the game was destroyed! Anyway, Professor Oak, a familiar face, is back to take you through the traditional name-giving stage and introduction into the world of Pokemon. However, this time around, the rival isn't immediately available to pick the name for. Hmm. And then off we go into the exciting new world of Gold and Silver. The options in the game would garner a total overhaul. The user settings became much more advanced, and the items pack was a million times more organized. It had separations, expendable items, balls, uh, hidden and technical machines, and key items. Look, you could even see the places where everything was stored. This also allowed for much more capacity and making it a lot easier to manage. Compared to the first generation's sloppy stack, the little ten-year-old who just shoved everything into his backpack as his journey continued, we also had the stylish and sleek Pokegear, a handheld wristwatch-like device with a map, a real-time clock, and a cell phone. The ideal tool for any Pokemon adventurer. Interestingly, the Pokegear never made it into later generations until the remakes of Gold and Silver once again. Shame on them. As, well, as expected, of course. As if we had an overload of new things to do, Pokemon were able to hold items. I was kind of skeptical of this at first, going, Oh, that's so stupid! Many Pokemon don't even have hands! How can they hold items? But anyway, it is a new layer of strategy, as you could give Pokémon berries, or stones, or anything else to hold what would affect its stats and abilities. But it wasn't just useful in battle. The held items could be traded via Pokémon trading, 
so you could give your friend that leaf stone that he's always been wanting and didn't want to pay for, but it's too early in the game for him to get it. Stuff like that made these new games totally more interactive and, oh yes, it was possible to buy letters and send them to your friends by the same means. We used to do this a lot and write all kinds of absurdities. The letters had different styles which could be brought at Pokemarts wherever they went. The Pokemon League Challenge is back as the primary goal. Duh, that's to be expected. You know, repeating the same formula. But thank goodness they didn't do that for future games. I... think. The mission is to confront and defeat the eight new gym leaders scattered across the towns and cities of Johto. And wouldn't you know it, the gym specialties greatly differ from Kanto's. From beginning to end, you've got Falconer, the blue-haired flying type enthusiast, Bugsy, whose gender we have a hard time identifying, the bug type gym leader, Whitney, the normal gym leader, whose badge looks like a road sign, Morty, the spooky ghost trainer, Chuck, the crazy fighting master, Jasmine, the meek steel gym leader, Price, the old ice sage, and Claire, who trains Dragon. Totally new and totally nuts. Isn't it interesting that the type specialties included at match Red, Blue, and Yellow's Elite Four? How very peculiar. The journey starts in the quiet and small town of Newbark. Yep, most of the towns and cities are named after plants, whereas towns and cities were named after colors in the color generations. So why weren't they just named after metals? Alkali City, Cobalt Town, Mercury Town? No? Uh, okay. Just like in the first game, you're a cool kid who has cool clothes on and starts in your upstairs room. After getting bugged by your mom and the new and young Professor Elm, who specializes in Pokemon evolution and development, apparently, it's up to you to be his little errand boy and fetch a certain Mr. Pokemon's newest discovery. Who is this Mr. Pokemon? And what kind of a name is that? I mean, sharing the name of the titular monsters and franchise, he must be someone really important indeed. Nope, not really. After getting the so-called discovery, which is, spoiler, a Togepi egg, of course, from him, you never hear from him ever again. Ever. Huh? Professor Oak? Professor Oak is back! He just so happened to visit Mr. Pokemon. And what are those strange giant electronic machines doing there? Is he a hacker, or what? Mr. Pokemon. And just so happens to again make you do something he claims he's too old to do himself. And for no money. That is, document and capture all the 250 Pokemon. Giving you the Pokedex. Oak dashes away, despite being too old for it, and we find out has become something of a sellout since we last saw him in the old games. What with his own radio show and all. And in Johto of all places! What a traitor, backstabbing jerk. Before heading on this task, you are given a selection of three Pokemon Elm conveniently has on his table, mirroring the historic beginning of the older games. And the starter Pokemon are again comprising of the types Grass, Fire, and Water. We are given the option of the brand new Pokemon Cyndaquil, Totodile, and Chikorita, which, again, are the difficulty levels of the beginning of the game. Remember Red and Blue? Charmander was hard, and Bulbasaur was easy. This time, it's Fire-type that's the easy one, and it can floor both starting gyms with no extra effort. The opposite goes for the Grass-type, Chikorita. On the way back from the neighboring Violet City, the rival arrives. Hey, he was the jerk who was peeking into Elm's laboratory right after we left! In typical rival style, he picks the Pokémon that has an advantage to yours and beating him this time around is really easy. A lot meaner than Blue, this guy is someone to look out for. And lo and behold, the police are investigating this Pokemon thief who stole the Pokemon from Elm's lab. Luckily, we found out his name. After finally finishing the errand, Professor Elm is shocked to see a Pokemon egg! Apparently living with Pokemon for thousands of years has not had anyone interested in how Pokemon reproduce. This is seen as a new discovery. Which of course it is, for us players and the game mechanics, but it shouldn't really be new to the people who live in the Pokemon world, for obvious reasons. But this is a special egg. How fruity. Now, it's finally time to head out into the wild world without any interruptions from there on. This time around, in the overworld, the term for the general area you walk around in, trainers sometimes look around and walk. 
making it harder to evade them for a battle once they stop you, instead of just standing around in one position all the time like in the older games. But it also gives you a chance to evade them as well. Oh yeah, and I just want to say, this guy's awesome. Rest in peace, dude. Rest in peace. Violet City is the first main city encountered. It includes the Sprout Tower, a weird Buddhist sort of monastery where these old bald guys train using Bellsprout and a surprise hoot hoot here and there. And they're supposed to be taken seriously? Inside it, you were able to capture Ghastly at night, apparently without the need of a self-scope. Yeah, remember that? The first town also had Earl's Pokemon Academy, very much in the vein of the easily forgotten school in Viridian City. But this was much more expanded. Violet also included, in this person's opinion, the best theme song in the entire gold and silver version. Falconer is the first gym leader there. With his crazy big hair and two Pidgey Pokemon, you can defeat him easily. And earn the Zephyr Badge. Huh, so in the new games, they always have a different order of Pokemon gyms, but never change the grass, fire, water starter types. Oh well. Faulkner's gym also had a giant dollar sign for a pathway. I guess it was a renovated bank. After defeating Faulkner and noticing a mysterious tree blocking the way, we find ourselves having to tread through the Union Cave, where you're also offered a slowpoke tail for an outrageous amount of money! Inside the cave were tons of new challenges and annoying fighters, and some exits would lead to the mysterious Ruins of Elf. Getting out easily, and heading down to Azalea Town, we find some familiar looking characters. Hmm. Azalea is famous for his senior citizen known as a short nutty guy who makes balls. No, not those balls, you dirty man. For Pokemon Trainers! His skills are quite renowned, and if you find apricorns, he'll turn them into various balls you can't normally find or buy. Apparently, some crazy people have been cutting slowpoke tails off of the poor slowpoke, and Kurt, which is his name, had enough of it. On the senile old man goes, hurts his hip supposedly, and you're once again asked to do battle against the bad guys in his place, since he's being stupid. Only to find out that it was... <gasps> Team Rocket! Surrender now, a pair to fight. <laughs> They're back! After being disbanded since Red, yeah, Red, remember Red? Defeated Giovanni three years earlier, in Red, Blue, and Yellow, Rocket revived and are on a quest to cause trouble and find their long-lost leader and get back into the business of dastardly proportions. You know what? I kind of want to try Slowpoke Tails now. Mmm. Must be really good. Yes, Gold and Silver is a continuation of the story from the first game. Two or three years have passed and things have changed. Isn't that cool? Then it's off to meet and defeat Gym Leader 2, Bugsy. A puny little kid with, surprise, big bug types to attack. Oh, and just for the record, he's a boy. Just burn him. After finishing a bunch of side quests and discovering that you ingeniously have to press the A button on the tree you want to cut instead of having to go through the start menu to the Pokemon to perform an HM move, which is a huge time saver and... Ah, so nice. We all knew about Pokemon Egg since we've seen it in the anime. And of course, Togepi. So, much to our prediction, that was an important feature in Pokemon Gold and Silver. Pokemon had genders. I mean, obviously we knew Pokemon had gender since the beginning, but now it's a factual addition to the game. Most of them would have percentages of females and males. Some would be female or male exclusives, such as Tauros, Jinx, Miltank, and Kangaskhan. Wait, Kangaskhan? Really? Kangaskhan always looked like a male to me. I thought it was like a seahorse or a penguin where the male would take care of the baby. Oh, disappointing. And some, especially the legendary Pokemon, would not have genders at all. That's just to inhibit legendary breeding, which is fair. Why can't Machop, Machoke, and Machamp have both genders? Isn't that kind of gross? Why do Ghastly, Haunter, and Gengar have genders if they're ghosts? There is a daycare center right after the Elex Forest where, unlike Red and Blue and Yellow, a couple would take care of two Pokemon. 
and if they're the right breeding group and the opposite genders, they might just produce an egg. And this is where it gets interesting. The egg would be a much stronger offspring, combined with a complex algorithm of different moves sometimes taken from its parents. You can start a Pokemon breeding business! Wait, no you can't. But this did give the Pokemon games such a more broad and customized spectrum. Anyway, the epic journey continues to Goldenrod City. Goldenrod City is the biggest in all of Johto. The sprawling metropolis is absolutely packed with things to do and trainers to battle. A giant supermarket of Pokemon goods and a basement full of crazy merchandise and services, not to mention queer Pokemon trainers, and the radio tower where Professor Oak shamelessly tells himself, I mean, uh, hosts a talk show about Pokemon. There's even a name raider, a bike store where the clerk trusts you so much to give you a bike immediately for free. And the next gym, the normal Pokemon trainer, Whitney. Get it? White? Normal? Whitey? Whitney? Whitney? Forget it. Within her gym were many female trainer classes, including the Blue Beauties, which are, in my opinion, the best looking beauties in any Pokemon game so far. In the US version, they added a little bit more shorts and took off her wink out of concern. They also did that to the swimmer. Nintendo of America must really hate winks. Despite her idiotic, childish demeanor, Whitney is ridiculously tough with her new Pokemon, Miltank and it's really, really annoying rollout attack. It gets stronger after every attack, and can easily one-hit KO Pokemon with a higher level. Do not underestimate the power of rollout. DO NOT! Defeating her gets you the plain badge, which looks very plain. But not until she has a good cry about it. Did any of you get frustrated after that? WHERE THE CRAP IS MY BADGE, YOU BRAT! Thankfully, all you have to do is talk to her again. And there you go. Then you got it. Then we were stuck by that annoying weird tree everyone was so worried about. Which, once you got the squirt bottle from that wonderful young lady in the flower shop, you could fight it. And it was Sudowoodoo, an aggravating goofy fox grass Pokemon. It's actually a rock type. That would surprise you if you didn't know any better. This was Gold and Silver's version of the road-blocking Snorlax of the old games. An imitation Pokémon. Clever. Right above Goldenrod was a National Johto Park, where they had fun activities to do. I always liked stuff like this, and I'm glad it's in Pokémon. Every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, they'd hold an official bug-catching contest, which works a lot like the hell that is the Safari Zone in which you have limited resources to capture some pretty rare bug Pokemon within the park. At least you get one Pokemon to weaken it, unlike the Safari Zone. This made the games feel so much more alive and real. You were even judged depending on the bugs you caught. Prizes galore, and wouldn't you know it, I got first place by blind luck! Pretty awesome. The park's shape also made up a giant Pokeball. Wait, wait. There's something I forgot to talk about. The battles. Probably the most important element in the game. It also has been expanded, detailed, and improved. The moment you encountered and fought an opposing Pokemon, it was pretty clear that they made some adjustments. And for the better. The HUD looked sleeker and more tactical, and showed not only the level, but the gender of each Pokemon present, including an important addition to your own Pokemon, the Blue Experience Bar. In the color games, it was impossible to accurately expect when your Pokemon would level up exactly, unless you were a mathematics nerd and calculated the experience points. Now, the blue bar would increase each time new experience points were gained after a battle, and fill up when the new level in the Pokemon's growth was reached. This was an important and savory addition. As if that wasn't enough, during wild encounters, a tiny Pokeball would appear on the left side of the opposing Pokemon's stat bar, reminding you that you caught that type already. Excellent! Battle mechanics were reworked, and new types were introduced too. In the previous versions, many fair complaints have been made on the supremacy of psychic Pokemon, especially the one we won't name right now. 
In the second generation, that has been rectified as the special stat, which was the stat that measured the power of each monster's special attack, was split into two. Special defense and special attack, changing some Pokemon's power completely. With the split of the special stat, the game became more of a fight for raising one of the four strategic stats and forcing the user to abandon one of them, thus creating a better balance in the Pokemon battles we see today. Attacks and Pokemon were also given an extra layer of complex properties. They too were split into two elemental types, physical and special. Both categories were connected to the attack and special attack stats on each Pokemon in regards to how powerfully they would use it. Attacks such as Fighting, Normal, Ground, and Bug were physical, and more, well, special types like Psychic, Ice, Electric, and Dragon, oh wait, Dragon? Whatever, were special, giving the Pokemon battle system a more intricate algorithm when fighting. Right after a few routes is the city of Ecrutique, an ancient city with an actual background and history. Its main tourist spots are two fairly tall towers located on each of the city's sides. One of them is called the Tin Tower, which was renamed the Bell Tower in the remakes and reminds me of American Tacos now. And the other, on the west side, is just the Burn Tower. Because frankly, it burned down. However, it was called the Brass Tower before its initial burning. According to the Ecrutique legend, the two legendary big birds, Lugia and Ho-Oh, perched on their tops and hung out. However, ever since the mysterious burning of the aptly named Burn Tower, Lugia left to the Whirl Islands in the south of Johto. According to the tales, Ho-Oh also left the Tin Tower. Both were never seen again. And three legendary Pokémon were said to have perished within the flame of the Brass Tower. Crazy monks block the entrance to the Tin Tower, so getting in there for now is impossible. But what is possible is to be able to attend a wonderful battle at the Ecrutique Dance Hall, challenging the five Kimono Girls and fighting their evolutions. Two of them are even new additions to this evolutionary chain. Beating them has a spectator who owns a dancing, surfing Rhydon. How awesome is that? And gives you the ever-helpful HM3. Serve, man. Then, finally, it's up to you to defeat gym leader number four, Morty. A ghost Pokemon trainer. His gym is inhabited by an invisible trail in which you have to know exactly where to step or else you fall over and start all over again. Thank goodness this isn't Legend of Zelda or we'd be dead. His ghost Pokemon pack a wild and unexpected edge, which is to be expected, and rewards you with the ever-popular Shadow Ball move and the Fog Badge. Sweet deal. But Ecrutique isn't fully explored yet. It's possible to travel into the Burn Tower, where the murky gray burn surroundings give way to the battle with the red-headed rival again, that fool. Anyway, after that, the tower serves as a mini cave where strength is required to oodle your way downstairs where, according to legend, the three legendary beasts, kind of like Gold Silver's counterparts to the legendary birds in red, blue, and yellow, have perished in the fire. And once you encounter them, they revive. Okay, so they don't revive, but they do wake up. But it would be really cool if they did revive, because it would look like this. Wait, does that mean we saw their burned, rotting corpses when we arrived? <laughs> and after that encounter, it is possible to encounter them at any random point around Johto, anywhere. Be prepared. Moving on, we get to the sea-happy marine city of Olivine, where the gym leader has left to their famous lighthouse to tend to the sick Ampharos. And after fighting a ton of annoying trainers, asks you to get to the offshore city of Cyanwood to bring some medicine for the Pokemon, which is supposed to be doomed to shine the light of the lighthouse. Reaching Cyanwood, getting the medicine and surfing back to Olivine, 
with a bunch of swimmers swimming in your way. The overconcerned gym leader, Jasmine, finally heals the stupid thing and resumes her rightful place as the gym leader. Afterwards, it's back to Cyanwood, where the gym's leader is a chubby fighting guy named Chuck. Despite the effort to be intimidating, he is easily dispatched by a psychic Pokemon. Especially since only owning two fighting types, it's a pretty easy beat. His wife gives you the most helpful of HMs. Number two. Time to stretch those wings. Now that Fly is in our possession, heading back to Acrotique City is a breeze for Pidgeotto here. As thanks for helping the Ampharos, which is doomed to light the lighthouse, Jasmine accepts the gym leader challenge, and battling the new Steel Tribe trainer is tricky. Gold and Silver had two new types, and Steel is one of them. In response to the overwhelming nature of the psychic type in the first generation, and the overpowering Mewtwo, Gold and Silver debuted two new types into the chart, Dark and Steel. Ooh, sounds so scary. Initially, Steel was somehow highly resistant to psychic attacks, and many others as well. The first generation Pokémon Magnemite and Magneton were now Steel Electric, instead of purely electric like in the first game. Steel had weakness, naturally, to fire and ground, but little else. Which made it a very good defensive choice, and something to be excited about. Steel is one of the most defensive and resistant types in the entire game, and Jasmine uses the new evolved form of the famous largest Pokémon, Onix who is now second largest. Its evolved form is Steelix. And it's quite the surprise that the meek Jasmine has this gigantic snake as her Pokemon. While we're on the same subject, let's talk about what I think is the most controversial addition added to the game. The other new type, Dark. It was specifically created to counter Psychic and bring balance to the type dominance of the games. Given a mean streak and attempting to create a, this new coming type as the cool bad boys of the Pokemon world, the dark type ignited a passionate hatred towards it for me as a kid. Preferring ghost and psychic types, the two types to naturally conform to this mysterious coolness, and hey, they existed before dark was even conceived. The addition of the Dark type, which has an overwhelming advantage to Psychic and Ghost, was artificially instigated to overshadow those two types. Personally, I feel this is the most overrated and illogical type in the entire game. As I said, it has this bad boy image to it, so it has moves that are supposed to be really mean and dark. And yet it's just a newcomer. The logically normal type move, Bite, was changed to Dark. Wait, why? What was that for? Can everything with a mouth and teeth bite? With that weird logic, how about changing Slash? Or maybe Tackle? Tackle should be dark. I know, change Double Edge. That sounds mean. Constrict? Why isn't that dark too? I mean, if Bite is dark, I can go on and on with this. Further creating an illogical and artificial favoritism, the Dark type was 100% resistant to Psychic. Yes, Mew's awesome psychic abilities was powerless against the might of Murkrow. Well, with moves such as Bite, Beat Up, Sucker Punch, Crunch, the Dark type was at least added in the physical category. Wait, wait, wait what? Special! Yes, Tackle is a physical move, but Bite is special. This is what I think of you, Dark type. Okay, I know, I know. The attack power of Dark never got above 100. And of course it was pathetic against Fighting and Bug. And I really have no problem with the Dark or Steel type being invented at all. I'm glad there are more types to choose from and to be challenged by. But with all this modifying for the new games the staff was noodling around with, couldn't they have made Ghost basically do the job a whole new type was created to do in the first place? That was the problem with the first generation anyway. But with Poison being weak against Psychic, and the Haunter trio never gotten rid of its senseless Poison subtype, and Ghost never being reformatted to destroy Psychic properly, the only thing I'm confused at is, why didn't that happen? Doing some research, it came to my attention that Ghost was in fact supposed to be resistant to Psychic attacks in the first generation. However, it was most likely a programming error, 
that caused what was ultimately in the color generation games. And they never fixed it. And since they didn't, wouldn't this special elemental type with ghosts inclusion have way too many types on it? Wait. Huh? Oh my goodness, what? Are you serious? Ghost is physical. Alright, let's see how Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines ghost. Pronunciation. Ghost. Function. Noun. Etymology. Middle English. Ghost. Gast. From Old English. Gast. Akin to Old High German. Geist. Spirit. Date. Before the 12th century. And what does it define it as? 1. The seat of life or intelligence. Soul. 2. A disembodied soul, especially the soul of a dead person believed to be an inhabitant of the unseen world, to appear in the living or bodily likeness. 3. Spirit. Demon. 4a. A faint shadowy trace. Okay, so with the exception of the red blood cell, everybody pretty much knows a ghost is a spirit. It's the least physical of any of the other elements, besides psychic, on the Pokemon elemental chart. And yet, some people thought it would be an absolutely brilliant move to put it into the physical category, simply because Dark is needed to beat the crap out of Psychic. So these old and retrogressive types are given the good kick in the nuts and brushed off like no one's business, to serve the purpose of the new favorite sons. Yeah, watch out Mewtwo, you can easily destroy any Pokemon, including the mysterious and scary ghosts, but your Psychic powers can't stand the chance against the indisputable power of beat up. Now that should have been in the first movie. I will use my psychic power. Oh, oh, oh. Hate it or love it, Dark and Steel, which is also a psychic killer somehow, is here to stay. And even though I think it's a horribly managed addition, it's now anchored in the mechanism of the Pokemon games. And with that, let's keep going. When traveling to the east, we end up with yet another annoying cave where we need Flash. So annoying. After that, annoying tread through, the town of Mahogany is in sight. And it's quite peaceful here. It's small and, oh, I got a rage candy bar. Mmm, lovely. That's such a lovely place. Oh, let's head to the store and, oh my, the music is sure ominous in there. The guy seems sleazy and, what's this? A slowpoke tail? Wasn't that a problem back in Azalea? Oh well, gotta try some more slowpoke tails. Awesome. Besides the fact that slowpoke tails need to be further exploited, something is really fishy in Mahogany Town. And, aha! Rockets are here to rip us off yet again. Apparently there's a disturbance at the northern lake of rage, starting another storyline and side quest. Reaching the lake, the infamous and very bad-tempered Red Gyarados, the first shiny Pokemon that is encountered, which you can catch if you want, attacks! As if adding all this extra detail and weight to the new expansions on the Pokemon game system wasn't enough. I sound like a smoker. There were also plenty more secrets to be discovered. In addition to making individual Pokemon more unique with genders and data memories, a new variation of Pokemon was added. A rare, oddly colored type of Pokemon, known as the Shiny. Called Shiny because when it was encountered, it would make a funky little star graphic animation on the screen. The reason for that was because it was compatible with the non-colored Game Boys, which you obviously normally wouldn't have distinguished otherwise. There was a shiny variation for each of the then known 251 species, and they would be encountered at random at any time, anywhere. Talk about bragging rights, how hard was it to actually find one? Well its rarity is so outrageous that the chances of running into a random shiny Pokemon would be approximately 8,192 to 1. The rarity of these monsters are incredible. However, excuse my questioning nature, but what was the point? Sure, it's a cool idea, but if the rarity of a shiny Pokemon is that astronomical, and apart from having a funky star swirl appear in front of it, what else makes it really special? Oh yes, it has a different coloration. Each Pokemon would be oddly colored. Some of them bear a striking difference to its original kind, yet most are simply just very, and I mean very, slightly different. 
I continue to question this as well, for something so impossibly hard to find, and I've totally done everything there is to do in gold and silver and never encountered a shiny in a normal way, and having zero benefit, most shiny Pokemon are just slightly differently colored. Don't get me wrong, some are well colored and amazing, like the red Gyarados, the green Scizor, the gold Steelix, those shinies are completely worth it just by their color alone, but now with only the color as the redeeming factor, why are the rest colored so horribly? Now think of how awesome it would be if they were colored like this. Now that's something to brag about, right? Hey, look at my blue Charmander! Oh yeah, that's nothing. Look at my red Bulbasaur. That would be really cool. Oh yeah, and what about a green Arcanine? Huh. If anything, to me, it just boggles the mind as to why Shinies weren't even given a more extreme coloring. Or cool symbols or something, you know, change the texture. And since most weren't, why were they so abhorrently difficult to obtain? All in all, the idea was good, the intention was good, but the execution has a lot of discarded opportunity. At least, that's what I think. After that, Lance! Who? Lance, the Dragon Master from the old Elite Four, is here to investigate this curious disturbance in which the Magikarp are forced to evolve into Hulk and Gyarados via some strange radio signal somewhere in Mahogany. Following the awesome Dragon Trainer, we find out that the sleazy store was just a cover-up for the basement area where Team Rocket hides out. Those guys never seem to change their methods, do they? Battling through the base, the Rockets are as annoying as they always were. And this time, they're distinguishable as females and males. Whereas in the old version, they were just goofy guys with whips. Also, there were the two Rocket executives who oversee the operations and are tougher to beat. Your job in the underground hideout is to put a stop to their fiendish operations by destroying the power generator that powers their evil radio waves which is causing all this Gyarados rampaging. But that isn't done easily as passwords need to be found and to get through the gates and finally Lance and you take down the electrodes forced to power the machine. Phew! A job well done. Lastly, after finishing that squabble, the local gym awaits your challenge. And wouldn't you know it, they use ice types. So after a highly frustrating time sliding across the gym to get to price, which is really, really time consuming and brain freezing, <laughs> Price, the ice guy, looks like a feeble old fool and not the least bit intimidating, which is a pretty good disguise. Fights your super awesome Pokemon that obviously went over his. After that icy battle, Elm of all people starts panicking like a wimp that he is and suggests you check out Goldenrod's radio tower, which is apparently taken over by Team Rocket just when we beat them at Mahogany Town. Time to teach them the lesson once and for all. Back at Goldenrod, the whole place is infested by Rocket grunts, and the radio tower needs to be conquered and cleansed. Heading inside, it's just like the Sylph Corporation building in red and blue, except this time, it has a bit more story and is less annoying with Rocket executives. Find the radio director and destroy Team Rocket. Being blocked often and finding a decoy, the battle continues in the Goldenrod Underground, where we fight our idiot rival again who is starting to think about his Pokemon abuse a little, after we kick his butt of course. And, of course, what would a Team Rocket hideout be without confusing switches? The combination of which is tricky to decipher. Finally, after fighting swarms of Rocket Grunts and Execs, down they go as we find out their final goal is to broadcast the resurrection of Team Rocket, which will hopefully get Giovanni to come back and lead them once again. However, this is easily finished as you beat the Rocket Executive on the top floor. Goodbye, Team Rocket. The radio director you rescued gives you, dun dun dun, the Rainbow Wing. Or Silver Wing, it's silver. 
What is the rainbow wing? Or silver? For this retrospective, we'll go for the rainbow wing, because gold is gold. Well, that's right. Ho-Oh awaits us up at Tin Tower. But not before we get badge number eight. But not before having to get through Ice Path. A barren, cold cave where you have to slide around the ice and perform very specific movements in order to progress in this wasteland of isolated, dark misfortune of a place. It's seriously the hardest and most frustrating area in the entire game. Not only is it abundant with slippery platforms, there's also the boulder moving, where you have to have one of your Pokemon use strength and drop the boulders into holes to make it let you get through the cave. And be careful not to move the boulders too far or in the wrong place or you'll get stuck and start over. <sighs> Classic Pokemon aggravation. The worst part about it is, of course, the interrupting wild Pokemon. Go away! Finally out of that hellish icy freezer, the mountainous city of Blackthorn calmly rests. And this place is great because it has cool dark roofs and uptight self-absorbed trainers who think they're the greatest ever. It's also home to the very useful Move Deleter. Got a useless move you want him to make your Pokemon forget? Especially those pesky hidden machine moves which you most likely taught your Pokemon after realizing you forgot the only one that already knew the move is in storage to progress further without having to backtrack? He's here for you right in one of those fancy black roofed houses. The final Johto Gym at Blackthorn is apparently home to Lance and his cousin, Claire. Both are dragon trainers, and Claire is the gym leader, self-professed blessed user of dragon Pokemon. Her gym is blocked by equally snooty people and... What? And you have to do exactly what you hated doing in the ice path by moving boulders again to make a pathway to get to Claire. Not fun. So finally, after that hard and aggravating work, Claire accepts your challenge and the last gym battle commences. She's a dragon user, and that means trouble. Unless you're Foxy and knew that the Ice Path had some ice types available to use against her dragons, you were in for a pretty decent match. Finally, after finishing the Ice Path and her stupid gym boulders and beating her, she... What? She doesn't even want to give you a badge! Demanding you get into the Dragon's Den, a lowly cave with an annoyingly tense background song for no reason, to get an artifact known as the Dragon's Fang. Dragons, dragons, dragons. Only then will she acknowledge your worth as a trainer. That's Pokemon anime logic. That's how Ash wins all his badges, not us real trainers. Oh well, once that is over, wait. How did she just sneak up on us like that in that cave? Never mind. The final badge is received, and Blackthorn City's use has been acquired. And we beat all eight Johto Gym Leaders! And let's backtrack to Ecruteak, where the legendary Ho-Oh awaits us. I kind of named it. No more annoying Ho-Oh worshipper sages now that the Rainbow Wing is in your possession. Oh, and in, in Silver, of course, it's reversed. You get the Silver Wing before the Rainbow one for obvious Lugia reasons. Which means you also get to the Whirl Islands before. Anyway, it's time for another puzzle. The tower itself is riddled with jumping boards. Much like the ice, that if you make a mistake, you have to go all over again. At least it's not too challenging. As you eagerly await the encounter with the legendary Ho-Oh on the top, and once there, it's time for a legendary encounter! The tower looks tiny from the outside, but it's really huge when you're on it. Anyway, enough loafing around, time for the fight! And time to catch it! Saving is what everyone will be doing, but I think it's cooler if it's a more natural, risky chance. Finally meet. You're mine. Go, Cedra. Fight, Bubble, Twist. See how good you are now, huh? Yeah, come on, come on. I, I can, I can take you. Yeah, right. Sure, it's flinched. Yeah. Okay, time to get my master balls, because I'm a totally not a cheater. What? What? No!
I am such a moron. That was a waste. If you don't capture it, Ho-Ho is gone forever. And there is nothing you can do to get it back. Well, at least not officially. Anyway, there's nothing else to do now than to face the new Elite Four. The Pokemon League! Just like in Red and Blue, backtracking to New Bark Town where you started is where you continue to reach everyone's favorite boss fight. The Pokemon League at... where else but the Indigo Plateau! The exact same area where you massacred the Elite Four two years prior in the color games. Using the new HM called Waterfall, you get through the Tojo Falls, a connecting cave between Johto and Kanto. Heroic music plays as the chubby guy heroically tells you that you've made it to the heroic region of Kanto! He's the best character in the game because he knows Kanto is superior. When I played this for the first time and the man said that to me, I was like this. A wave of old memories flourish as the steady uphill journey commences where a bunch of pretty tough cool trainers challenge you. As we get further up into the nostalgic lands of Kanto, the feeling is exuberant and pretty exciting. When finally, we're back at Victory Road. Not as many trainers as to fight as before, but a good opportunity to capture some strong Pokemon. And then, the red-headed rival kid challenges you once more. <laughs> Seriously, he's stalking you. Report him to the authorities. And finally defeated, the red-headed kid succumbs to his conscience. <gasps> A change of heart. <laughs> uh, kind of. Then, it's the Elite Four. The same group that was fought in the color games only because it's been two years. A shift within the members occurred, of course. Be sure to pack in as many useful items as possible because this is going to be the long haul of Pokemon Battle. And look here! The old man who can teleport you back home because you might just not be ready. I have no idea why this guy is even here. He's just being a nuisance, really. Go away, jerk. Anyway, time to meet and defeat the Elite. Instead of a mysterious voice telling you not to leave, like in the first one, it's a giant thick wall that falls down, blocking the way. And the first member to beat is... a, a joke. No, seriously, look at him. A tie? A mask? Uh, what? <laughs> That's just the stupidest, least intimidating moron I've ever seen, and he's supposed to be part of the Pokemon League? <laughs> Will? Okay, it's, it's Will. A psychic master, I guess. He has Xatus and stuff like that. Whatever. Second up is... What's this? Green grass? And... Wait, I know that laugh! It can't be. Psych for sore eyes, it's, it's Koga! The old gym leader from Fugis of City, in the color games. The deadly poison ninja master has elevated to Pokemon League status, and unlike Will, packs a punch, and looks like he means business while doing it. After defeating Koga, the only remaining elite from the previous Elite Four, from the other color games, is Bruno. And he's back with less strong, but equally intimidating fighting and ground types. Last of the Elite Four is a new character called Karen. She specializes in dark types and thinks they're the coolest and meanest ever, which is why it's even more fun to see her defeated. Watch out for that Houndoom who keeps crunching your Pokemon. Fighting is mean enough, but crunching? That's so cool. And after being defeated, Karen makes one of the most important statements, at least in my opinion, in the entire game series. Differentiating what today's players have been accustomed to doing, and what Pokemon was mostly about. Ah, that was very wise of you, Karen. Thank you. And then, the champion is, of course, that crazy cape-wearing, red-haired nut, Lance, the Dragon Master. 
Unlike Will, who is snooty and takes himself too seriously, Lance, despite wearing a Dracula cape, respects you. It comes from the first game, and you have the final fight. Again, Ben's dragon types are tricky and tough. But one ice Pokemon on your team, and all his Pokemon fall down like bowling pins. And the Elite Four has been conquered, and the game's primary story has ended. Just like the old games, Professor Oak comes in and gives us a pep talk. And look, the radio tower's Mary is here to give us an interview, which is sadly rejected by Lance. And no matter how many times you beat the Elite Four, she never gets to do that interview. <laughs> and also because the game couldn't handle that much of a feature. But it would be back in later installments. As usual, the heroic montage is played as the Pokemon used to wipe the floor clean with the Elite Four is immortalized at the Pokemon Hall of Fame. And making us, you, the new Pokemon League Champion! We are treated with celebratory credits with quite cute music that just gets you inside. Listen to that. And as usual, after the credits, we're back in the place we started, New Bark Town. Although this time, Professor Elm curiously calls you to see him and gives you an SS ticket. What? Just like the old games, only this time, it works? Yes, indeed! For anyone who was oblivious to the fact that before playing Gold and Silver, myself included, you are free to go back to where the real trainers live and the old games were played. In Kanto. Beating the Elite Four was only half of the game. A new journey has started. A time to head back to the true beginning. With Kanto! Land of Freedom! Inside SS Aqua, you're involved in a little girl missing situation that you must complete. A gentleman lost his family relative wandering around the ship and it's your job to get her back. Of course, on the way you battle trainers, much like the SS Anne, inside the cabins as you make your search. Once found, bugging the poor captain, it's finally time to step into the wild world of Kanto. Vermilion City, oh glory. Everything is the way we remember it, except in color. Well, maybe not the way we remember it, eh? Places have changed, new buildings are built, and oh! Sadly, that man and his macho never got that house done. Tragic. It is now time to get those Pokemon trained and fight the much tougher Kanto gym leaders. Through time, they've changed, but not their Pokemon choices. It's interesting that you don't have to follow the road like you did in the color games. From Vermilion to Fuchsia to who knows where else. Many things have indeed changed, and as we go through the old and familiar landscape, that moon is tiny and we find the red-headed kid back to challenges once again. Oh, the poor guy must really be suffering. Then, in the middle of Mount Moon is a little mysterious shop, and during Monday nights, it's possible to see a satanic Clefairy ritual. Just kidding. Oh look, a moonstone! The most drastic change, though, could very well be in Lavender Town. It was once a scary, spooky town where people kept going on and on about ghosts and creepy stuff and... Of course, it's famous Pokemon Tower, where many dead Pokemon were buried. But what happened? Music now is playing in major key instead of a minor one this time. And it's so much nicer. And the dreadful Pokemon Tower has been renovated into a radio tower. Wowza! You'd think those ghosts would be really upset at this. And haunt it. But I guess it's alright with them. The graves, there were hundreds, are now, I don't know, destroyed or moved to Mr. Fuji's house next door. The guy you saved from Team Rocket in the color games. 
It becomes very easy to travel from Lavender to Saffron, to Celadon, and... What's this? In Saffron City, we are treated with the new system of transport with the Magnet Train! A super fast train that travels from Goldenrod to Johto to Saffron City in Kanto, except both the radio tower at Lavender Town and the bullet, I mean, magnet train, are down for the count because something has been going nuts with the power plant. What? The power plant? Yes! Remember that abandoned and dangerous power plant three years ago, just a few yards away from Cerulean City? With Zapdos? The Titan of Thunder! Well, it's now back in operation. Apparently, someone has been tinkering with it and stole a key piece. But just as we enter the good old Cerulean Gym, we see a... a foreign Team Rocket member. What? You gotta love his amazing Yoda-like jumbling of words. Monstera go go! Defeating this quirky Rocket member and giving him the bad news that you destroyed Team Rocket makes him tell you that he hid the missing generator in the still empty Cerulean Gym. Believe me, Playing this the first time was a chore. It's totally hidden! You'd need the item finder or just blind mashing of the A button to find that missing hidden piece. Well, eventually found and given back. The bullet, I mean magnet train, is in operation once more. <laughs> but where's Misty and her gym peers, you ask? Well... We're such pests. Anyway, Bill's not in the shack, he's in Johto, because he's lame. And we can defeat Misty, who's got some strong Pokémon this time. And let her hair down, and wears a new costume. And at Saffron, we can revisit all our old friends, like Copycat! Remember her? She lost her doll somewhere at Vermilion, and if you find it in return, she'll give you the bullet- I mean, Magnet Train's pass to be able to use that nifty gizmo forever. At Celadon, Nothing's changed, really. Everything's quite serene, peaceful city it is. And, and, oh look, the old perv is still outside the Celadon girls' only gym. Erica has a haircut, and... Oh wait, there's the Poké doll! Some weeboo found it and couldn't catch a real Clefairy is using it as a substitute. Hmm. <laughs> and this is all at the old Pokémon fan club in Vermilion. And the chairman is still the same Rapidash-loving cook that he always was. With her doll back, Copycat continues to copy people, and we continue to use the Bolt Magnet Train to travel from Kanto to Johto and back. <laughs> and curiously enough, our hero character actually talks! Look at that! Oh, and Sabrina? <laughs> she hasn't changed a bit. However, her Pokémon have... WATCH OUT! Espeon! But in the remakes, she's given a refreshing makeover. It really is a marvel to see all these new additions to the old world, such as the fact that the forest in Viridian City has been reduced to a silly maze, and the Safari Zone, the beloved evil of the Safari Zone, has closed down. Interestingly, the Safari Zone was meant to be in the game, but it was scrapped, probably due to the limitations of the incredibly tiny, by our standards today at least, memory of the Game Boy cartridge. Lieutenant Surge has sunglasses! Brock is... Brock. How cool is that? And now, since her father is in the Pokémon League, Janine, Koga's daughter, is the new gym leader in Fuchsia City. Remember the invisible walls in Koga's gym? This has that. And... All the members of the gym are disguised as Janine! Be careful. These are ninjas. Determined to live up to her dad's really cool standards, Janine is an opponent you don't want to underestimate. What am I saying? Kick her butt, it's easy. Not all this backtracking into Kanto is simply fan fodder. It has some story to it, too. Quickly getting another obnoxious Snorlax to move using the Poke Flute radio channel. Poke Flute radio channel? Who's gonna sleep with this thing on air? Anyway, escaping the Snorlax and getting into Diglett Cave, and finally into Pallet Town. The place of memory and importance. Red has an N64 now! Professor Oak's there! 
What's he doing there? You'd think he'd be out in Johto doing that money-making radio channel, but no! The professor is still in his old lab in Kanto. And of course, it's kind of weird to talk to Red's mom after playing the colored games and realizing she's not your mother anymore. Or not. Once you get to the island of Cinnabar, the wondrous place where fire trainers and genetic tinkering was prominent, it's revealed that a volcano, a freaking volcano, went all Pompeii on them and totally submerged the city under a newly formed rock formation. Leaving the place barren. Rather sad, actually. Hey, at least the Pokemon Center is totally intact. Hooray! Mysterious. Meeting you there is... Blue! Who? The old rival from the color games! No way! Yes way! Telling you the unfortunate event that took place between the ending of the first game and the beginning of the second. It's soon revealed that it's still possible to get the next badge. And Blue pretends to be a helicopter. Inside the now clean Seafoam Islands where Articuno once roosted like the silly blue bird it is. Blaine! The hobo gym leader is sitting in wait for a new challenge, and he surely hasn't changed either. Blue is the new gym leader of Viridian City now. Ever since Giovanni left, Blue made it his duty to challenge all trainers to this final badge. Despite maturing a little since before, he still has a bit of a snarky side to him. But fighting Blue is both nostalgic and pretty intense. Incidentally, why does his gym look like Lego blocks? Also, does anyone remember our good friend Glasses Boy who follows us to every gym tournament, even in the remote Seafoam Islands? It's time to pay him some respect. The guy keeps giving you good advice on how to beat each gym leader, and yet we just cast the poor guy aside like nothing. Well, yeah, he kind of deserves it. Another stalker on our hands, great. In Viridian City, the last resort before the final bout, the school was replaced with a very useful trainer club where it is possible to fight your clone, I mean other trainers from around the world, <laughs> to harness and sharpen your Pokemon commanding skills. Too bad it's only available once per day, but it is a useful addition nonetheless. After all is said and done, and Kanto is thoroughly looked through, there is a final battle. The true final and secret battle that truly ends the journey of in my opinion, the best Pokemon game to date. Next up, we travel to a fortified... Ah, oh, crap! Anyway, we travel to a fortified unknown cave full of traps and annoying Pokemon. A cave with a damp, dark secret. And a power hiding within. Mount Silver? No, this is the World Islands. A scattered surface batch of islands with an interlocking labyrinth of a cave just below the surface. A place of legendary proportions because you get to catch Lugia in it. Oh, surprise. There it is! The legendary psychic Pokemon. One of the first of the gold and silver ones to be seen, and one of the best, too. Time to catch it! Hooray! Unlike the previous Ho-Oh squabble, this one is caught. Here's an idea! Wouldn't it have been more interesting if it were only possible to capture Ho-Oh and Lugia exclusive to their own versions, making the game just a little bit more unique and challenging to acquire both legendary Pokémon? Just some food for thought. On second thought, maybe it's not. Anyway, after that necessary sidetrack, it's time to head back to the place of humble beginnings and a vast potential. Pallet Town. Where Blue's extremely smoking hot sister doesn't give you her number, which is a bummer, but Professor Oak gives you leave to head on to Mount Silver, a giant cave of further mystery and dark secrets. Foreboding music plays as the walk towards the final battle and a last trek through another cave is set in motion. It's pretty intimidating, especially since people intimidate you like this. And we're off. Oh, crap! Moving on, the dark vastness of Mount Silver really makes you feel like these guys spared no expense designing the caverns for one last exploration. And after much frustration, a big, giant chamber holds within... The Guy! It's a familiar sprite, isn't it? Because it's you! 
It's you three years ago. It's red. It's saying nothing except a dot dot dot. It's a brawl against none other than the kid you played in red, blue, and yellow. And, oh man, he looks like the yellow version sprite. Lame. Anyway, he has all the starters from the old games and all the Pokemon you'd expect him to have. And the battle commences. And yes, I am going to keep this battle going so you can see how awesome I am by beating him even though my Pokemon are 10 levels below him and I didn't use any cheats whatsoever. Go, Lugi! Watch it! Pikachu's using a charm attack. Lugi, Hydro Pump! Go! No! No! Curse you, Pikachu! Super effective now. Okay, let's go, Hydro Pump, get him down! Ha! The strongest Pokemon down! Uh oh, Blastoise! Lugi, that's enough, come back! Go, Funk Snap! Alright, let's go, let's hit him with the Thunder! Wait, shouldn't that actually help the electricity? Get it done. And he has an Espeon. Why? Maybe it's because he couldn't bring himself to choose an evolution stone and then one day, pop, your Eevee evolved into something you didn't want it to. Ooh, intimidating. Unexpected match and becomes the hardest battle ever. Finish it off with the Thunder Punch. Oh no, not Snorlax. Go, Lugi. And let's skip this point because. Good job, Pidget. Now it's time. To no, Charizard! That's enough, come back! There's no love for Wartorn, which is why we have Wartorn. Let's get him down. Hydro Pump! Go! It's tough stuff, man. It's time for a potion and rain dance. Tenderized now. Go ahead, finish him off with the hydro pump. Yeah, that's the end of him. Good job, Angel. Uh oh. Hey, God, that's enough. Come back. Let's go, Hawkeye. Besides Mewtwo, Haunter is my favorite Pokemon. He's really awesome. Look at him, he's just so cool! 
skill, Shadow Ball. Oh no, he will stop his complexion. The summit is strong. I know what we're gonna do. Nightshade! <laughs> Yeah, this is bad. Oh. Ha! Not very effective. Well, I know one thing we can do. This is why ghosts rock. And of course, eventually, winning will be imminent. Pokemon will be tested in the fruitful victory of us claim the championship title of legendary proportions. And with that, the primary game ends. Except, of course, it never has to end. There's still Pokemon to capture. Let's not forget the too many different kinds of unknown and people to battle. Real people. It's Pokemon! And the battle rages on. But after the touching ending credits one last time, the game's story and features truly cease. And the game has been beaten. Kanto and Johto have been explored, and a generation of Pokemon has been realized. The original team that began with Green and Red reached their final goal in creating a very addicting and successful franchise. And with that said, this retrospective also reaches its end. I hope you had fun, and that some of it has brought you memories of some new surprises. Just kidding! Hey look, because Yellow was such a success, Game Freak decided to give Gold and Silver a, a special edition treatment. Pokemon breaks old boundaries as new innovations come into play, and of course change the structure of the games for the better. It's Pokemon Crystal! And it's coming up next. I got you, Good night. You've conquered Red. You've mastered blue. You've triumphed over yellow. You've caught them all. And now you're ready for the next step. Welcome to the world of Pokemon Gold and Silver. Tons of new Pokemon. New adventures and worlds to explore. New badges to collect. So you've got to ask yourself, have you got what it takes? Pokemon Gold and Silver ready to for everyone. I've got to catch them all. I'm on a horse. 2001. Gold and Silver were, as you most likely could have guessed, successes. Silver version? The sequel adventures to Red and Blue definitely proved its worth, and the expansion into the world of Pokemon was accepted and celebrated by kids the world over. I say that a lot. Except some. When Gold and Silver first came out, I was pretty resentful of it. And at that time, as with many things, kids get into a stage where stuff isn't cool anymore, it's lame. You really hate it. Which was the case with Pokemon. You're bitch. Pokemon, crazy card game. In the wake of Gold and Silver's pretty much massive success, Game Freak and Nintendo decided to do what they did with Pokemon Yellow. And during the holidays of 2001, released Gold and Silver with a special edition treatment. Anyway, by calling them Gold and Silver, two medals that are widely regarded as the top two, it seemed to be stupid to continue going higher and higher with precious stones and medals. But they did anyway, and they called it Pokemon Crystal Version! Pikachu was the main box monster of the special edition in Red and Blue, and now it's Suicune, one of the three legendary beasts of Johto. Strange decision considering Suicune is part of a trio, and in no way as special as Pikachu is within the Pokemon franchise. But hey, what do I know? As expected, Crystal is a special edition to the two previous games. So they went along and fixed game sprites, Check out Raikou, Entei, and Suicune, for instance. Ooh! Making minor adjustments, and for the first time, animating the Pokémon when you encounter them! 
a feat many were itching to have included. Crystal is also best known for, and historic to, finally, finally, include the option of choosing between a boy and a girl. The first ever playable girl character made her debut in Pokemon Crystal. The blue-haired spunky Chris will always be remembered and honored as the mother of all female playable characters throughout the timeline of Pokemon. Or not. You suck, Game Freak. The inventory and menu was given a more feminine touch once the female character was being played. Crystal also had a new, extra storyline to go with Gold and Silver's primary story. A spooky and mysterious story that even gave you a new opening video. A story about Suicune and the unknown. Interesting as both Pokemon had their own movie made of them. The story includes a few new characters to the game. One of them is a guy called Yusin, who <laughs> looks like he escaped from a circus. Anyway, he's he's a very serious person and battles you for his <laughs> respect. Sure, he's been traveling long and hard looking for the legendary Suicune. I'm sure Suicune wouldn't have a hard time looking for him if, uh, with what he's wearing. Anyway, Suicune makes a few prominent appearances without running away like the other legendary beasts, and you can capture it easier. Indeed, you get a clear bell after defeating Team Rocket at the radio tower instead of the rainbow or silver wing, which enables you to encounter it at Tin Tower. It was also possible to head to the ruins of Alf and decipher a mystery of the unknown which had you completing a few little puzzles and being able to capture a lot more unknown than in gold and silver. And is it just me, or does each successive Pokemon game get easier and easier? Just one example is that more grassland was added in the western route of Violet City for Crystal, allowing you to capture a Growlithe, or Growlithe, making Sprout Tower, Falconer, and Bugsy much easier to defeat. Huh. <laughs> Us gold and silver veterans headed the hard way. And we made it through. Crystal also fixed those blasted Pokegear phone calls. In gold and silver, there was an option where a random trainer you battled would want your phone number to call you for a rematch, which in theory is a great idea. And to make your relationship with these characters more realistic, they would call you at the most inappropriate times to tell you about their talentless Pokemon training lives. However, in Gold and Silver, the only bits of dialogue you'd get would be the same repetitive thing. Hi, Phil. Hello. Good evening. How are your Pokemon doing? Fine. I always keep my Clefairy in top shape by going to Pokemon centers. Uh -huh. You have to hear this. Mm -hmm. I battled a Giraffarate the other day. No kidding. It was easy. I had a type advantage. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Hi, Phil. Good evening. How are your Pokemon doing? I always keep my Nidoran in top shape by going to Pokemon centers. You have to hear this. I battled a Wooper the other day. It was easy. I had a type yeah. advantage. Bye -bye. But in Crystal, that all would change. The trainers would still be annoying and pathetic, but more lifelike. You did calls that made much more sense, but were still pathetic. This is Liz. Hi. Oh, listen, listen. Uh -huh. My new Dorian, it's so pretty and <laughs> so awesome, uh -huh. but very much eek and lovely. Okay. Just ravishing. Oh, too much. Hug it. Sleeping. That's right. Pretty. Uh -huh. <sighs> So nice. Okay. Cute. Oops. Look at the time. I chatted too long. I'm sorry I took too much of your time. I love chatting. Okay, I'll yeah. call you later. How about never? There was even a radio show host in Goldenrod Radio Tower called Buena. Woo! Who would let you answer questions in her game show to receive wonderful little prizes. Oh, and let's not forget about the mystery gifts. These were also a feature on Gold and Silver, but it became more well known when Crystal came out. 
Remember those pointless infrared connector tops at the Game Boy Colors? Yeah, they could be used for a little event called the Mystery Gift. It was activated by talking to a mysterious little girl on the fifth floor of the Goldenrod department store. Look at that little shrimp. Then, with other games activated in the same way, you could connect the two Game Boys together using that infrared port, and there'd be an option to get gifts! What kind of gifts? Cocaine! I mean, berries, vitamins, and decorations. What? Yeah, decorations. Oh, I forgot to mention those. In all three Generation 2 games, it was possible to go into your room and actually make some use of it. In the game, it was available to have a multitude of customizable room decorations such as rugs, plants, consoles, carpets, and Pokemon dolls. It was kind of pointless, but still a fun little addition that added to the customization theme of the Pokemon games. Many other tiny changes were also prominent in this new game, such as some better graphics to the landscape. Just look at this! The burn tower is actually, well, what do you know, burned! How do they illustrate the burn tower in gold and silver? Like this. I'm glad Ho-Oh is a professional roof builder. The game also gave you a little overhead sign that appears once you reach a new city, telling you where you are. Talk about making the game easier, woohoo! And then another new expansion called the Battle Tower. A place located just west of Olivine City for you to battle seven really powerful computer opponents with really horrible and specific rules to follow. This serves as a frustrating but healthy way of battling with a challenge, in case many of your Pokemon got to a gigantically high level. Also, after defeating the Pompous Clare, who still doesn't give you the badge, the Dragon's Den has been expanded. Well, a little. You must now travel into a big shrine-like place where Claire's grandpappy, a uh, dragon user leader man, quizzes you on some battling issues. And he won't take any of your other answers unless it's the correct one. Talk about being easy. Once passed, Claire still doesn't want to give you her badge. This game needs a punch button! Sadly, we can't do that. But thankfully, Grandfather Sage Man threatens to tell Lance and all is well afterwards. In the Japanese version of Pokemon Crystal, things were more fun. Yeah. Crystal had some very cool features which wouldn't be picked up until much later. The idea behind Crystal was, since possibly everyone and their dog has one in Japan, to make it connectable via mobile phone, where it was possible to trade and battle for many long distances. It also had the secret of Celebi. In Japan, there was a special cell phone giveaway event where you could, via cell phone adapter, receive a GS ball. Yes! The infamous ball that went nowhere in the anime! Give it to Kurt and visit Elex Forks for him. Where that shrine that was virtually pointless in the English version summons a level 30 Celebi for your battling needs and becomes available to get captured. And the most interesting thing about this is, it was fully translated in English, but there was never a feature for it. Also, there was a news machine within the game, where you could read about other players' adventures within Pokemon Crystal via cell phone news. Now that's an extra layer of realism Pokemon should keep going for. Pokemon Crystal, while improving many things and glazing over gold and silver games, proved to Nintendo and Game Freak that they could once again make a lot of money from the same game with minor adjustments, more or less. And we all dug into it. Even though its features were cool and made a lot of impact within the gameplay of Pokemon, I think it would have been better to keep the three game cycle kind of at a minimum. Especially since it's more like an add-on than a new game. But that didn't stop us silly children from getting suckered into buying the same game, probably even thrice. Just to have all three versions. Oh well, hopefully we've all learned our lessons and know now that waiting a year or two for the special editions will reap the most reward and save us a good 60 to 70 bucks. That's American dollars. Crystal was spiffy, it made improvements, and it hailed new features. Although being yourself was still impossible. One of the things I was thinking of since I was 10 but still never insignated. How slow of them. Anyway, to conclude this episode, 
Crystal rocks. Eh? Get it? Ah, uh, get it? Get it. Okay, I'm done. Oh, holy crap, Wild Raikou appeared! Am I the only one who thinks Raikou, Entei, and Suikun wear some sort of legendary masks of power? I mean, come on! Look at that. Anyway, because I'm so good at this game, Silk Corporation gave me all their Master Balls and- <laughs> He's mine! I know what you're thinking, what's the reason of this at the end? And why is it so important that I show you this? Simply because when I first saw Raikou in Crystal, which was back in 2001, and his cry animation, I immediately thought, hey! Isn't Raikou making a lo 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 sound? And sure enough, I still think so. I mean, look! Look at his tongue! That should have been Raikou's voice. Once upon a time, it was the year 2000. There was this thing called Pokemon. It was cool. Why was it cool? Because it had little monsters that you could catch with little balls and personalize them, collect them, and train them to create an unbeatable team of elite fighters. And then, of course, pit them against each other for a sporty and not to mention magical competitive fight. Pokemon wasn't limited to that. But that was the core gameplay. When the second generation of Pocket Monster Glory blossomed in Japan in 1999, and later in the US in the fall of 2000, the Pokemon craze may have shrank a little, but it was still strong if you knew where to look. Nerds. Even on TV, Kids WB finished with the Orange Islands and began airing the third season in the ongoing Pokemon anime. This time, having Ash and his friends head around Johto, the new region in the ever-expanding Pokemon world. Creating many more characters, amusing yet irrelevant plot points, plot holes, and many other things that were evident in the first two seasons, but were further expanded in the Johto region. Including mercilessly replacing his old-time buddies Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, and upgrading to a whole new set of friends with Chikorita, Cyndaquil, and Totodile. But that's another story for another age. I don't know if you were this dumb or not, but as a kid, I took the plunge into solving the ancient Pokemon mysteries by sticking Pokemon Gold into a Game Boy game pack and in vain at attempting to get it to work on the original Pokemon Stadium game. And it worked! No, it didn't work. But just like the times in 1998 to 1999, battles again had to be fought using a link cable, two Game Boys, and a good amount of imagination. I also tried using Pokemon Stadium as a means to bring our Pokemon battles to life for short movies that really sucked. Ready for the Pokemon match of your life? Meet the world's strongest Pokemon master. Me. So, welcome to my gym. See her picking all those Pokemon. All the fighting Pokemon you can handle, huh? Go, Polyrath! And I choose my Pokemon, Mewtwo! Attack! Yeah, thanks, Free Battle, for making my gym look like Old Man Peabody's farm with your lack of stadium-level selection. It was all 8-bit still pictures and tangled link cables until the news arrived of Pokémon Stadium 2, which was to be released on March 2001. Commercial break. So, yes. you want to use your gold yes. and silver skills in a 3D yes. world? Destroy him! Slap him! Well, here's the thought. Where'd you get that? Now you can get Pokemon Stadium 2, the only place you can upload your Game Boy Pokemon on your N64 and battle with over 250 characters in 3D. You've got skills. Save them for the game. Pokemon Stadium 2, rated E for everyone. Am I the only one who thought the big 2 on the logo felt like someone was about to pass his deadline and he just used Microsoft PowerPoint to quickly create an out-of-place looking 2 onto the existing Stadium logo? It's horrible. The Pokemon website hailed its arrival and even got its own. Anyone remember the then amazing looking and immersive website experience? They really pushed that red Gyarados in there, didn't they? 
There was also a team of the day, which you could check out some strategic team combinations to get some ideas on strategy and whatever like that. This never really happened in 2001, but I always thought it was a form of interactive internet statistics where kids informed Nintendo of their strategy team while the game logged the team's wins and stats. But was it? Was it? I know not. Just like Stadium 1, this was going to be the great arena to satisfy the goal of the core gameplay of the Pokemon series. It was the platform for the big leagues. Forget playing on a link cable with awful 2D graphics. Knowing how good Stadium 1 was to our badly needs, 2 would have to surpass it. And with that, it did. This game, as is rather normal for spin-offs, was developed not by Game Freak itself as much as HAL Labs. Yeah! The guys that made Super Smash Bros., the first stadium, and Snap. So what happened in the early month of March 2001? Most of you rushed out into the wild weather, bugged your parents, and went out to buy the game. I just rented it, and only got it after an aggravating long wait when a relative got it for me for Christmas, and the mail was delayed for months. It was agony and torture for a 12-year-old. But lo and behold, eventually it arrived. And there was nothing to do but to rip it out of the box and bash it into the N64 and hit the on switch. Pokemon Stadium 2 opened with a much more chilled and laid back intro. Quite different from Stadium 1. And oh look, it's the new Pokemon. The main screen was shown and the menu selection was similar to the first stadium, but also more expanded. The basic theme of the menu was sort of meant to look as that of a sort of kind of carnival-y mood, you know? Which explains the new addition of a few personified touches with some humans being present, at least in 2D picture form, as you hit buttons and get to features in Stadium 2. Like the Kimono Girls, for example. The Battle Now option returned, and the stadium was... what's this? White City? Stadium 2 took the idea by personifying the stadium atmosphere by giving the stadium area a name. White City good idea, but it didn't have much to do with the whole gold-silver theme, now did it? What does white stand for in context of gold and silver? I don't know, but neither did you! On the main menu, right next to the White City Battle Now and Event Battle and options, there was the mystery gift. Aw, how cute. You could actually trade with that little girl from Goldenrod to get new items. Aw, look at that little face. Who wouldn't trade with that little girl? She's hiding something. It was also interesting in this game when Pokemon Crystal came out, and many of us brave souls took the dare into plugging it into Stadium 2, and it was fully compatible and readable despite Crystal coming out almost a year after it. Now that's just nothing short of magic. Or just smart programming. The HUD on the older games felt alright at the time, but when 2 came out, the graphical style obviously leaned towards the Metal series, and did look much better and more refined. Not only were there graphical improvements with various attacks and effects, but the Pokeball animation differed. And here's something you might have not really noticed, but in Stadium 1, the Pokeball throw animation that releases a Pokemon to the arena happened incredibly quickly, in a split second. Stadium 2, on the other hand, had this pretty but very time-consuming animation where you saw a close-up of the ball, and it slowly opens, and after a good three to four seconds releases the Pokemon. Sure, this sounds like a nitpick, but I always felt like these animations should be able to be switched off, or skippable, or even just be made to go faster. Double time! Hey look! The Game Boy Tower is back. How nice of them to add that again. It was really helpful for all our Pokemon catching and collecting needs during our stay at the Pokemon Stadium. You know, if someone wanted to trade or you needed to battle with specific level Pokemon, the Game Boy Tower was there for you to fulfill that requirement. Very tactical and just so nice of them. Of course there was a Dodo on Dodrio speeds and all that good stuff. As usual, White City wasn't added to the Pokemon geography and has since been forgotten. Yep, way to be creative. But within this White City was the Stadium, the Gym Leader Castle, Oaks Lab, the Free Battle, Mini Games, and Game Boy Tower, which were all present in the old game. But what's this? Pokemon Academy? My room? In Stadium 2, these two new features were added, and they weren't half bad. My room was a little feature that kind of was, though. It made no real sense. However, it did whet the appetite of many children that want to play a true 3D polygonal Pokemon game. My room, enabled, connected with the gold-silver cartridge using the game pack from Stadium 1, 
you to look at your own room, which in the Game Boy games were averagely customizable with giant dolls, small dolls, plants, bed sheets, and carpets, and trophies and stuff, to be seen in N64 3D graphics. A cool, but kind of pointless idea. Not only that, but you couldn't look at it while rotating with the 360 degree view. But the best part of this was that my neighbor friend, who hung out with us almost every day back then, he insisted that there was a cheat to perform within the My Room feature that you'd be able to walk out of the stairs, out of the room, and be able to see the entire Pokemon world in first person 3D. Yeah, that would definitely be an afterthought easter egg because it's so easy to program and design. Moving on. Earl's Pokemon Academy, unlike My Room, was an extremely useful and surprisingly deep library of Pokemon information. Listen to that ridiculously funky music. The thing was split into two options. Classroom and library. Stuff that you probably never knew about the technical statistical side of Pokemon was available to research and discover. Remember that chubby backwards talking foreigner in Violet City in the Game Boy games? Well, his education empire expanded into the N64, and even though he looks like an annoying git, we owe him our gratitude. Earl's Pokemon Academy came complete with ridiculously difficult quizzes, lists, stats, graphs, and even lectures. Yes, this addition to Stadium 2 could have easily been its own game for all the wealth of information we could get from it. You can actually learn various tricks and strategies in lectures, in which afterwards, Earl would quiz you if you remember them or not. As if that wasn't enough, there were test battles you could take, just like what we saw in the Pokemon anime from time to time. That's true. With other students at the academy to practice on advanced strategic knowledge. The academy also sported the ridiculously detailed library, where you could read about just about anything and everything you need to know, and not know, from the game. Items lists and descriptions, Pokemon, moves, type matchups, even controls and egg groups for breeding. Items had descriptions and sometimes the library was split between the colors and metal games. Pokemon stats could be looked at in major detail without paying for one of those lovely strategy guides. At least until the Pokemon set of small came out and of course the internet. And give you tips on what cartridge you could find them in and shows its moves, evolutions, and what it was weak and strong against. This was quite the encyclopedic and useful addition to the stadium games, for sure. It was a gold mine of information, and Earl is our friend. He really is. Mario. Within White City, not limited to wonderful information, was the comeback of the Gym Leader Castle. This time, however, not only did the castle look more interesting, but each playfield was more intricately customized based on each leader's preferred type. Falconer's Gym was a lofty area perfect for bird Pokemon. Morty's portion of the castle was a spooky, ghostly dungeon-like environment. Clear's Arena had teeth on the outside, and each portion of the castle really felt so, so much cooler than the original Gym Leader Castle of Stadium 1, where it was just the same stinking arena, but with different subtle colors and effects. As usual with the Gym Leader Castle, the Gym Leaders themselves not only had their preferred types, but other types to counter it with, lest you think all you need is a Machamp to take down Whitney. It also featured a surprise attack where Team Rocket blocks progress within the castle, and a battle ensues. This also hinted at an actual little story that was being told to all stadium-like fights. And I have to be honest and say that that's a very good thing. The characters you battle actually reply back and use some phrases, as opposed to the old game where it was very robotic and lifeless. The Elite Four returned, and their arena also looked great. It was a terrace, much like the first stadiums, but each successive victory got you visibly higher up the castle, until it became nighttime and a giant Charizard statue proclaimed your fight with Lance. But what's this? Once you beat that, the Kanto Gym Leader Castle is unlocked! Just like the Game Boy games, this is two games in one, and eight new stages are revealed, with the good old but simple areas seen in the original stadium game. Unlike Stadium 1, 2 had a suspend and continue option to enable you to actually save progress in battle and continue some other time. You know how the Gym Leader Castle never has the Gym Leader first but a grunt to fight before that? How nice of it to do so! 
Stadium One was brutal and never gave you that realistic, acceptable future. In White City and making a comeback was, of course, Professor Oak's Stadium Lab, improving what we loved in his Stadium One lab. All the old things were back, such as the trading machine, Pokedex, and item and Pokemon storage. The Pokedex was not only improved, but looked so much nicer. It had a categorizing feature, which gave you a fun chance to look at that silly animation and find Pokemon easily. And look at that! You could actually zoom in on a Pokemon and rotate around! Something the old stadium never allowed. The PC, which was the storage unit for Pokemon and items, was really useful and quite realistic because just like Stadium 1, it allowed storing Pokemon and items for your Game Boy Game Pack onto the N64 cartridge. <laughs> I still can't get over that. It's such a cool thing. I can store a Pokemon from one game and then retrieve it with another. Same goes with items. And it even looks like a PC interface. You could also categorize, group, and organize Pokemon in your boxes, party, or the N64 Stadium cartridge. Check their stats, make them hold items, move them around. The only thing missing is a comparison chart. So anyway, we stored all kinds of Pokemon in the N64 cartridge to be given for anyone who needs them. Because we're nice guys. Look, even a red Gyarados was up for grabs. Check out all those retarded nicknames. Huh. Okay, I could keep talking about how cool the PC is in Stadium 2 because of how practical it was compared to the Game Boy game, and how it bridged the transferring of Pokemon and items with other game cartridges, resulting in exciting customization and interactivity. But I won't. Okay, moving on. The Stadium was of course the main feature. Duh. It was the primary place to fight and do all kinds of nifty fighty things in it too. Just like Stadium 1 before it, this stadium had Little Cup, Poke Cup, and Prime Cup. We all know Prime Cup and how its unlimited free-for-all merciless nature rocks and how its arena map looks awful, and of course the Poke Cup which was the primary playing field of the game and how it had a limitation of level 50 Pokemon. It was all redesigned too. The Prime Cup still looks awful. The Poke Cup looked like a more modern version of the Poke Cup in the original stadium, but it would have been nice to get the old Poke Cup back. The redesign wasn't awful, but it started the trend of slowly modernizing the arenas in the game, so when future arenas came out, they turned more and more abstract and less stadium like, and focused on more unrelatable, fantastical areas, which simply don't feel as down to earth as the normal looking stadiums full of cheering crowds. <laughs> Sorry, sidetrack. Each stadium had four stages. Pokeball, Great Ball, Ultra Ball, and Master Ball. Just like the first game. The Pika Cup and Petite Cup of the first game were squished together to just one, called the Little Cup. Which was a good idea, considering the two cups were almost identical. All the Pokemon in the Little Cup have to be at the compact level of five. And I'll admit, it's fun seeing how one HP makes such a big difference for those Pokemon and small others. All of them had to be unevolved Pokemon, too. Aw, oh, cute, isn't it? The biggest stadium was reserved not for the Poke Cup, but for a new feature called the Challenge Cup. The idea behind the Challenge Cup, given the fact that there are like a hundred little playing fields in one giant arena, is that this stadium gives you a pre-selected group of Pokemon, and you have to use them to defeat your opponents with them. Eh, cool idea. But why was this meant to look like the primary stage of the game? You know, it's huge. The arena definitely looked cool, even though the other fields in the distance never seemed to have other Pokemon fighting each other. Quite challenging. Oh, the puns. And now, the mini-games. Remember how fun the games were in the old one? Yes, they were. Wanna bet these are just as fun and more so? Yeah. Not only is there a minigame gallery of such classics like Rampage Rollout, Tumbling Togepi, Furret's Frolic, Eager Eevee... Well, come to think of it, Stadium 1 games had more energy to them. The ones in 2 were more brain teasers than hitting the controller as fast as you can. Pichu's Power Plant was a more difficult rehash of the power plant of the minigames in Stadium 1. And Tumbling Togepi felt a lot like Run Red Hat or Run. Regardless, they were still really fun. And it was also possible, if you had a Game Boy Game Pack inserted, 
to have your own Pokemon from your own game participate in a few of the mini-games. Now that's cool! And not only that, but you could have Pokemon not specifically playable in some mini-games included from your Game Boy. Like in Clear Cut Challenge, where if you had no Game Boy Game Pack, you'd only have Scyther and Pinsir available to play. And that's what all the computers would have, too. But if you had a Scizor in your Game Boy game, you'd be able to get him in there! Come on, cut that thing! Ah, oh, little chubby claws. Oh, and Ammonite would swindle its way into tumbling Togepi. That's so random and awesome! That was great. So was the Giraffe Rig on For It's Frolic, a game where you'd get these giant Pokeballs to try to headbutt them into your own goal to score points. Master Balls were huge. And who didn't like Delibird Delivery with that Pikachu N64? Hey, I have that! Also, there's a tournament for the minigames much like the one in Stadium 1, though this time they actually made use of everything and gave it an interesting method of play. And it gave you coins in which it would actually give them to you in the Game Boy game if you had the coin case. Finally, people using the Game Boy's interactivity to some purpose. So great. The minigame section also had a quiz. As if Earl's Pokemon Academy wasn't enough, you'd get quizzed here too. Look at Mary, she's such an annoying little... You'd be able to outquiz your friends with this quiz quizzing. The thing had a championship too. Gotta love these minigames. Better organized. And now, finally, we enter what I obviously think is the main event for Pokemon Stadium. The free battle. It's the ultimate place where you... Uh, I said this in the last stadium review. However, this is so much better because this had options. Customization. You could actually change rules. Combine players, have a giant four-player rumble using your absolute best Pokémon, and truly test your skills against opponents from around the world. That is, as long as they were a few feet away from you. Two cool trainers are statically standing there, blinking, and are on the menu as you could pick rules and team combinations and even customize the rules. Talk about a first! In the Stadium 2 game, it was possible to make up your own rules for the free battle and give them amusing names. Pokemon Battle Party tournaments were a definite must. You could be the Stadium Dungeon Master, and they could be your contestants. Hope some of you did that. We did, for we saw it was good. What is the single best thing that happened in Stadium 2? The free battle. The ultimate Pokemon Arena in the stadium game, finally, finally, had a stage selection! You could select any, any stage map from the Stadium 2 game. Praise be the Pokegods! And with that, the ultimate battles commence, and Pokemon history was made. Fire! a nice little Pokemon Park level for the free battle. Ah, very relaxing. Like that map. Then there was also the event battle, which required two game packs to be on at once to fight event battles, which, you know, who cares? The free battle did this better. Despite the event battle having a feature for a time limit, it just was really clunky and it, we hardly ever got it working because we didn't match with the rules. Yeah, great event battle. Now, of course, when Pokemon Stadium 2 was completed, all that is left for you is to get challenged by your rival in his evil lair. The rival is, in fact, question mark, question mark, question mark, from the Gold Silver games. And instead of Mewtwo being the final boss of Stadium 1, it's this guy with a bunch of super strong Pokemon, which includes Mewtwo. Beating him, of course, unlocks round two, and makes everything harder. And... It's all at not night, but dusk! And is it me, but does Stadium 2 bend the rules? These battles are the hardest to master! This game was really useful to us as kids, not only for its Pokémon Battle Royale, but also because we made our own Pokémon Live Action series, and used it for the Pokémon effects. The problem with that was, of course, the HUD. 
Mm, too bad you couldn't take those off. And with that, Stadium 2 brought out the best in Stadium 1 and thoroughly improved on it. In fact, I'll have to say, Stadium 2 is the ultimate companion piece to the first two generation Pokemon games. And with its compatibility and interactivity with the Game Boy games, I think, makes it the most important secondary game to the Pokemon series. Pokemon Stadium 2 really is the ultimate 3D arena. And more than that, it allowed fantastic battles between friends on a big screen in full color, and also could become a resource base, Pokemon daycare, and educational asset for the Game Boy games. Pokemon Stadium 2 was and is Groove 2 at its finest. Nintendo is awesome. Starting out way back in 1989, yeah, Japan was so advanced that they already made video games back then. Just kidding. It started out as a Hanafuda or flower gaming card company. What are these Hanafuda cards, you ask? Kind of like our own normal card deck, except with flowers. Kind of like that onigiri is Japan sandwich, Hanafuda cards are their variant of cards. Anyway, in the 1970s, Nintendo started going electronic. And before you knew it, became a powerhouse of gaming innovation. And digital goodness known the world over. Characters like Mario, Luigi, Donkey Kong are household names. And it has collected an esteemed collection of well-loved characters and stories under its roof. So what crazy idea did some loser by the name of Masahiro Sakurai under the development company HAL Labs think of? A game where the most popular Nintendo characters duke it out on a highly addicting fighting game of pure solid goodness. Thinking it wouldn't be accepted, Sakurai pitched the demo to them anyway, because he's obviously not a loser. And wouldn't you know it, Nintendo must have some really great people working there because they accepted it and, when it was finished, it quickly rose to fame and became a staple in Nintendo series itself. Something's gone wrong in the happy-go-lucky world of Nintendo. Introducing Super Smash Brothers, where all your favorite characters go toe-to-toe -to -toe in one four-player star-studded slam fest only on Nintendo 64. The first title was released in 1999. And guess who joined the roster of playable characters? Why, Pikachu, of course! And a hidden Jigglypuff to boot. Both could be set against the likes of Samus, Captain Falcon, or Fox McCloud in a never-ending fight to get the other knocked square out of the playing field. The game's fast-paced, energetic style kept interest and enjoyability at a high rate in which you never wanted to stop. I love how off the wall this was made, and you can tell it was fun for the designers because there were many secrets and nods to each game, and the art style was fluid and awesome. And even the very concept is nuts! In a very good way. The game had Saffron City as a playing field, which was of course Pokemon's very own Saffron City, and it had a bunch of Pokemon popping up from the area and giving you a hard time. Like that Charmander! I mean Charmander. What the crap is a Charmander doing on a roof of a building? And why is this thing so threatening? Never mind. Another great feature was that each character could shift colors so you can distinguish the player's choice. Better than just having a random hue. Later in 2001, with the advent of the successor of the N64, one of the GameCube's debut titles was Super Smash Bros. sequel. <laughs> And to this day, it's still one of the best in the GameCube's library. I actually bought a cube solely to play this on. If the two Smash Brothers games were cars, Super Smash Brothers Melee would be the limo hummer compared to the first one's Volkswagen bug. The game was ex supremely expanded, far better looking, more fluid, more enjoyable, and contained a Fort Knox sized stash of secret characters, trivia, collectible trophies, and game modes. The first Smash Brothers had a total of 12 playable characters. Melee had more than double! In addition to Jigglypuff and Pikachu, 
there was also Pikachu's next-gen pre-evolution. Pikachu! Aw, cute. But it was kind of a clone of Pikachu. Well, with almost the same moves and movements, except it was faster and hurt itself when attacking. And another cutesy Pokemon with... Oh yeah, it wasn't a cutesy poo Pokemon this time. In a very surprising turn of events, a totally hideously evil, ugly Pokemon called Mewtwo of all the other actually popular Pokemon became a playable character, much to my disbelief and exuberant joy. <laughs> With Melee, there were modes upon modes of challenges and fights, high energy, comic style, and addictive as always. So many areas to battle and so many combatants. I always picked either Mewtwo or Bowser. Yeah, I realize both are low tier. But if you knew enough, they could very well make you feel good about your love for them. In the game, special items would fall from the sky to be used against the opponent. The cool thing about it is that they were items from other Nintendo games and products. Well, this was in the first one, but... Such as the mushroom from Mario, the old NES laser gun, and Pokeballs. The cool thing about Pokeballs is that they do exactly what they should do. Release a random Pokemon to deliver extra damage. And my word, I cannot believe how much stuff was crammed into such a small disc. Almost 30 different Pokemon could come out of the Pokeball. Some were useless, like Goldeen, and some made everyone crap their pants in fear. There were two Pokemon-based levels in the game. Saffron didn't return, but we had Pokemon Stadium, a living arena in Kanto that would change texture. I kind of wish it would have stayed the same. I like plastic arenas. But then there was the infamous Poke Floats, which I think is the lamest place to fight. You know, it's just a bunch of Pokemon Stadium models pretending to be giant balloons. Kind of stupid. But hey, it's still Pokemon, and it didn't hurt the game at all. Despite coming out three years after the original Smash Brothers, Melee's sequel would have us waiting for seven. Super Smash Brothers Brawl finally exploded onto shelves for the Nintendo Wii in March 2008. And it was Super Smash Brothers more or less perfected. Like I said, more or less. I know many of us play these in real tournaments, and I'm not totally knowledgeable in this. However, in were many, many new characters, and out were a few. The gameplay was still the same, but slightly tweaked and improved. Still very addicting. Nintendo is awesome for many reasons, and one of them is to be able to plug in your old GameCube controller into this system, giving us the power to unleash our brawling skills the way we were meant to unleash it. Even more secrets and items were available in the game, while in my opinion not as revolutionary as Melee, had more Pokemon characters. In addition to Pikachu and Jigglypuff, the Pokemon Trainer, Red from Generation 3 Revamp, with three playable Pokemon, Charizard, Ivysaur, and Squidow, entered the arena. Mewtwo was back, except he's blue, and has shorts. Wait, who's that? Oh yeah, Mewtwo was replaced by some sort of creature called Luc... Luc... Lucaprio... Luc Sorry, Lucario. Anyway, jokes aside, because I don't want to get barbecued, Mewtwo was intended to be in the game until it was agreed that there were too many good Pokemon in Brawl, Generation 1. So, to further create awareness and advertise the Diamond and Pearl games, they took out Mewtwo, made him more agile and sturdy, changed movesets a bit, and changed his appearance and replaced it with Lucario. Because if it was Mewtwo, the game would have exploded when played due to too much perfection. Okay, sorry, sorry, jokes aside. To have known that Mewtwo was taken out only because there were too many Gen 1 Pokemon in the game says a lot about the coolness of Masahiro Sakurai and all the other crazy nutjobs that made this game possible. The reasons he was taken out makes perfect sense. So anyway, listing the improvements to the new game would be a massive video in itself, but I will say that the characters were able to catch a little glowy rainbowy orb and perform the ultimate smash move. Dangerous. The future of Super Smash Bros. is not too certain. Brawl is insane, and there won't be a shortage of players. However, I hope you enjoyed this little insight on Super Smash Bros. concerning Pokémon. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>